to record it too. So, uh, okay. So you can post it later. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Typical Skeptic Podcast, and welcome to everybody who's uh, who's been joining us live for this show. I have with me a good friend. I have with me uh, Greg Yawakia. Uh, he's from the Zuni tribe. He's a Zuni elder, and he knows about um, you know the star beings, like the native uh, contacts. And his nephew is going to be joining us, Nashima, today to tell us about the. Uh, alien legends so it's going to be uh Here is. it's going to be really cool hey nice to meet you nashima thank you for coming on oh wait hold on greg this is playing through the speaker hold on hold on hold on sorry sorry okay let me mute this okay great sorry sorry about that okay um but uh, hi nashima nice to meet you thank you for joining us how are you guys doing today how are you Good. All right. Are we on now? Yeah, I can't hear you guys that well, though. I can't hear Nashima that well. I mean, huh. Is that better? Uh, I can hear you, Greg, really good. Uh, what about Nashima? Can you say something, Nashima, just in case? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, that's good. Okay, okay. great. Okay, all right. We're awesome. We're, we're great. So, all right. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on, guys. How are you today? We're doing great. We're doing great. And like I said, uh, as I talked to you earlier. Man, when you come out here on the reservation in Zuni, New Mexico, we get all kinds of weather. And right now, like I said, we started out with sunshine. Then we had snow, and now it's raining. And I think the wind's going to start to blow. I don't know. I don't know, but we got all kinds of activities going on. So I um I brought my nephew along because he he's gonna, you know, like I said, we're gonna be doing a tour, a space tour, alien tour, what we call it. And um he's gonna he's very knowledgeable on the hieroglyphs that we have. And um I'll let him talk about that a little more, a little bit, bit before before I join in, but uh, I want to start him out with that hieroglyphs pictures. I'm I'm sorry we did we we got them, but we couldn't download him real good on a, to show them to you. But um, I'll let you talk about that. Also, uh, talk about the alien pictographs and uh and uh supernova. Yeah, we we have plenty of um. Oh, uh, Julius Otholi is my English name, <laughs> uh, but my Indian name is uh, Nashama. Um, grew up here in Zuni, uh, went off to school, but came back home and uh, very knowledgeable. A lot of the things that we were taught was uh, from our grandparents. And uh, we we're very uh, lucky to have a lot of these uh, um, ruins out here. And um, many of these ruins have a lot of uh, petroglyphs, pictographs. And uh, what Keke was saying, you know, uh, we have um, evidence of uh aliens uh we to get some uh powerpoint done but uh the weather's been kind of crazy here so our internet's been kind of shoddy and couldn't really download a lot of that but um even here uh we have uh evidence of the supernova of 1054 uh which was uh, uh documented uh here in zuni uh also at the great kivas down about 16 miles from here and then also at uh, Chaco Canyon. Uh, so, um, but on that time, uh, around that time frame, something must have happened where there's pictographs of a lightning strike coming down uh, to the earth. And then there's a little spaceman that's standing there. Um, and, but, you know, there's, you know, our, our people used to do a lot of stargazing and, uh, you know, uh, took um <clears throat> would uh track the stars the planets and all so you know there's a lot of uh information out here and that's just not one place i mean there's many other historic spots around here that have uh evidence of uh extraterrestrial beings so even some that look like ufos as well which you know our ancestors were saying that you know were either uh kachinas or other star beings that came down to visit to give us that knowledge. Um, what, are, what are some of these other places? I'd love to hear about it. Like in and and all this stuff. It sounds really interesting. There's some down in uh, Canyon de Chez, 
uh, that's on uh, about maybe four hours away. Then there's uh, Hoven Weep, uh, which is almost right there by uh, Utah. It's actually in Utah, which is about eight hours away. But throughout the whole South, greater Southwest, you know, there's so many petroglyphs, pectographs, and all that, that, you know, it's really hard to document them all. Uh, even outside of uh, Albuquerque at a Petroglyph National uh, Monument, there's so many more there. So... <clears throat> I guess the closest one that we have around here, we call it on the Zuni Reservation, it's called the Great Kiva Ruins. And Heshot um, Usta is what they call it in Zuni. But it's called Great Kiva Ruins. And that ruin um, was occupied or part, part of the Chaco era, you know, the Chaco Canyon era. Yeah. Chaco Canyon was created, but was never really occupied and so you know we have again hieroglyphs over there at the great kiva ruins which is part of our tour tour stop you know because we're going to take them up to the mountains and let them see themselves and like i said one of the fascinating things that um i started to study was about tiamat but there's too much uh you know hypothesis on that stuff to where i kind of backed off on it but now that I get here and I see that, I, you know, look at the pictographs about the great supernova, about 1054 that was documented. And, you know, looking at the pictograph and really see it, uh, the archaeologists were amazed that it got documented. So it must have been really showing up in the sky. And so in here in Zuni, we have two groups or organizations that really used to take care of our celestial system and that are the galaxy fraternity and also our stargazer but stargazer is supposed to be a lineage passed down uh talent however since it hasn't been passed down we really don't have one now at this time but we still go by the stars because some of the elders will go out and look at the stars outside and say, okay, it's now time. And when they say it's not, it's now, it's in the middle of the night. It's not midnight. It's usually like three o'clock in the morning. They call it Mela Pikwaikya. And that means that it's time when it's like in 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 at three o'clock in the morning, it's like the witching hour for a lot of a lot of the Salem witches, you know. That was the witching hour. That's because it, and why they call that. The middle of the t time, night and day, is after 3 o'clock in the morning. Our area would not get cold to man. So if it's going to be like minus 20 degrees right at 3 o'clock in the morning, that's as cold. That's the coldest spot of the night. And that's why during the day, if you look at the weather, the hottest time of the day is at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's not high noon where the sun's straight up above you. That's the middle of the day. Three o'clock is actually the middle of the day. Three a.m. or th three p.m. You know that's three a.m. is middle of the night. Three p.m. is middle of the day. So, you know, we and then our galaxy fraternity are the ones that will uh, allow and teach and watch and guard over you as you astral travel. They do astral travel. So, you know, all this we have. So. Anyway, I, I'll let Julius talk a little bit more about the Chaco era, you know, about the Great Kiva Ruins. So the Great Kiva Ruins, um, well, well, Chaco Canyon back in the day uh, was supposedly a really big, huge hub like Cahokia. And in our in our ways, we we're told that people with extraordinary powers used to live there. And that there were many secret societies there that took part in many, you know, ceremonies that dealt with the stars. Chaco Canyon is actually built, if you look into it, when the sun rises at the equinox and in the summer. And that whole place, there's when the sun rises, it rises at certain points within that area. And then there's also portholes and all. 
like on the first day of spring, you know, there's lights that shine into the kiva that spot that have these different, you know, wall indentions or pictographs, pictographs, where it shows, you know, there are certain kind of ceremonies that had to be performed. And, you know, you know, astronomers and even archaeologists were like, well, why did they, you know, why did they study the stars? Why this? Why that? And in our ways, like Keke was saying about the galaxies of fraternity, you know, our societies originated elsewhere and then they ended up coming to Zuni, which is considered the middle of the world, Halona Itiwana. And we were looking for that middle place. And once we found it, and when Chaco was occupied, those many of those societies eventually came down to Zuni. And that's our, in our songs, in our prayers. And it's all interconnected. There's a, there's a book called the Zuni Atlas that actually shows the journey of the Zuni people and like the medicine societies and a lot of the many different um, things that we have in our culture. You know, there was, you know, all these little factions that went off and eventually they all moved away, but yet they ended up coming back here to Zuni. And to this day, we still have a lot of those societies that um, were, you know, occupied at Chaco Canyon. I mean, scientists and archaeologists are still wondering, you know, why Chaco Canyon was there, because it was so vast and so big and built perfectly to the alignment of the sun, of the moon, and certain points in the stars. And, you know, they're saying, you know, what happened to these people? And in our ways, you know, there are stories that, you know, that they became so great with that power that they might have eventually went up into space. And so that's how, you know, that's why they disappeared. You know, and scientists and archaeologists are like, well, whatever happened to them? Was it cannibalism? Was it this? Was it that? Was it diseases? And, you know, in our own ways, you know, we have these stories, we have these prayers that talk about things that happened long ago, but we don't, we don't, you know, express it to everybody. You know, a lot of that stuff is, you know, still secret, you know, society stuff that's passed down within those um, societies. And here, you know, we're, you know, as we're growing up and as the stories that we're being told, you know, you start putting one and one together. Oh, so this is how it happened. That's how it happened. And then we start asking our elders and they're like, oh, you know, and then they explain it to us a little bit more. So that's where we get our knowledge from, which is passed down to us. And sometimes it's really hard to try and interpret a lot of that stuff because the wording is so archaic and that's the, it's kind of like Latin. You know, it's a dead language and, you know, but yet those words and those songs are still sung to this day. We know the meaning of them here and here, but when we try to speak it and we try to, you know, understand it, we can't. But it's just that knowledge that has been passed on. You know, there was so many stuff that happened, like supernatural powers where, you know, you could move objects from one place to another. You could walk through walls. You know, even to this day, there are medicine, medicine men. If you fast enough, you know, you can walk through the walls, you can heal, you can do things just by the power of, you know, our ancestors. And all that stuff is written on these rocks. And many of those um, pictographs, hieroglyphics, and all that, some of them have lost their meaning. So we're trying to figure, okay, so what does it mean? And now with, you know, with, the internet and with, you know, everything's, you know, right there at the tip of your fingers. And so we're finding these correlations like Chuck is talking about, you know, has talked about the Emerald tablets, this and that. And, you know, now I'm seeing, you know, there's a greater picture to, you know, what our ancestors knew, you know, stuff that the Egyptians knew. We also in our own way have that too. Just like, you know, there's ISIS or the, Horus and all them, and we have our own names for them in our own language. And, you know, thanks to Kyakya, you know, that opened up my eyes a little bit more. It's like, you know, because I, I had my own little Zuni ways and, you know, thinking that this was just my world. Now I'm seeing that, hey, there's a greater connection to everything in this world. 
And, you know, that's why. Do you think this world was like all connected at one point, like all the continents were like, you know, because you know how they say there's like Egyptian evidence in the Grand Canyon. Do you ever see any evidence of that out there where you guys are? Or what do you think? Yes, yes, we do. I mean, I mean, the alchemy symbology is everywhere. That's, you know, and I use the alchemy symbology, the power of symbols, you know, and, and it, it resonates with the chakras and also the seven uh, layers of your energy center, energy centers, you know, and it, and it is so funny that, and I was starting to explain to him yesterday about all that, the chakras and the energy points regarding, and the medicine wheel, how it all correlates. But, you know, in the Hopi, Hopi prophecy, third hand shaking, if you listen to it, it said, the reason why a lot of people think that the earth is flat is because at one point in 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 the beginning, probably right after the Tiamat, and when the earth started spinning, it was one big solid continent, just like the Armentis. You know, the Armentis went under the ocean. Well, this one big continent was so big, and the four colors of our medicine well, white, yellow, red, and black, are the four skin colors of the world and since people started bickering and not getting along and everything well earthquakes decided to break up the continents and scientists now tell you we're on the continental drift that's why it broke up and we're starting to drift apart they always tell us i don't care how big united states is we're floating above water you know we're for floating above water so, you know, and all these things that, you know, we are taught, we don't take it for granted because we have to keep it within our everyday lives because what we experience, you know, like, like I was telling him, you know, the, the first energy center, you know, a chakra, the root chakra is our mother earth chakra on our medicine well. That's the beginning. That's the survival. And when you take it into your own self, that is when you say, okay, at this moment, not yesterday, not tomorrow, but at this moment, I'm a survival. We all went through a lot of um, either abuse or, you know, just all kinds of crazy stuff in our life. And yet we still survive. So we are survivals, and it takes a traumatic uh, event in our lives to really wake us up, wake us up to, you know, to survive. And once we survive, that's the root chakra, survival, to not realize that we are survivors if we are living this day, this second, you know. And on the medicine wheel, that's the south, red, Mother Earth, and to the chakras, that's the root chakra and to the energy, you know, that's the same thing. Uh, survival, you know, that's the first step of it. The second step is the emotion, you know, well, you start working on yourself on these energy levels and chakras and all that. Well, in the medicine world, it's emotion, which is to the West, you know, which is, you know, the color black water and that water is spirit. So, you got to be able to work on all these all these events that we're talking about. And then next one is energy, which is, you know, again, working on yourself. When you're working with your emotion and your positive energy together, then you start working on your vibration. And same thing with your energy center points. You know, there's a sacral, there's which is, you know, the next one. Then there is energy, you know, which is fire. Then there's vibration. And when we get to the vibration, you will realize that you are a different person. You are, you know, a strong person. And if you look at it, like he was saying, at one point, um, when they first realized the Native Americans in the Southwest, Matilda Cox Stevenson came out here with his with her husband. Her husband was Colonel Stevenson, was the commanding officer of the military base, which is located, I'd say about 50 miles from here. There was a Fort Wingate, 
her husband managed at Fort Wingate in the 1800s. Matilda Cox Stevenson came to Zuni and started documenting what is Zuni all about. And when she started seeing, as she said, the miracle, like psychic surgery and stuff like that, uh, she started documenting it. And when she submitted that book, there's a book out on that, which is the Ethnology Report of Zuni People, 1800s. And then she was sent back to really get in detail. But when she started asking about the detail of everything, you know, they kind of told her and they didn't tell her everything. It's like nowadays what I tell them, tell people, the doctor will heal you, but just heal the avatar. But you don't need that, you know, synthetic medication if you allow your spirit to control the body and not the body control the spirit. Because the body can rejuvenate. And if the spirit tells the body to rejuvenate and heal itself, that will work. Because how is it how is it written? You know, poha is a scientific term for psychic surgery, which is using, you know, universal energy, bringing it to the earthly matter. Now, they they got that figured out, universal energy to earthly matter, but they can't teach it because they left one thing out, which is the spiritual part. You know, and our Holy Trinity is mind, body, and soul. So mind is connected to the universe. The body is here on Mother Earth. And the soul is an infinite being that came into the body. So we are connection. That's why we really, when we do ceremonies, you have to connect with the father and the mother. And we are just vessels. We are not the healers. We are just vessels. And, you know, so all these things that we talk about and super beings like Sky beings, and I and I and and I like the word space people because you know Kim does light language and all that. Well, when I I guess like I should tell people, I must have gone to the bathroom or must have took a nap. Well, they were teaching me this in my Kiva group. I was start I started my training in 1969, my my Kiva training, and. And that was a long time ago. And they, they taught me everything. The elders at that time really taught you. And they did not teach you about how to do things. They just taught you the modalities and about you. That way, when you raise your energy up, things that are unexplainable, that words cannot define, happens. You know, I've seen people have a fork in their hand, metal fork, and just use their energy and watch that metal fork limp over like a hot metal piece, like nothing. And then they, they put it down. You know, I'm sure you've seen that. What causes that? Well, I can tell you what causes that, but then I'm going to have to take 20 years of your life to really explain to you, but it's all about you. If you're willing to learn it, that's what's going to happen. That's what you can do. Like you said, you can walk through walls. You can ask to travel. You can, you know, ask to drill travel and you can remote view you know and you can feel other people's energy because when you start working on your vibration that's the wind air air that's our 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 uh the fourth vibration chakra fourth level of consciousness you know that is air and because why is the air you can't see the air but you can feel it you can blow on your hand and feel the air you can go outside when it's a windy day. You can feel the air, but you can't see it. But when you raise your vibration up, you'll start seeing that. You'll start seeing people's energy. You'll start seeing the wind blow and, you know, everything. And they say, how can I? Don't question it. Because when you doubt yourself, you're bringing your vibration down. You know, and so all these things that are real and they were up to us and you know, Clifford Mahoudi, the late Clifford Mahoudi, you know, was trying to pass this on to the people that everything is doable. But he didn't accomplish it. So, you know, 
I kind of picked up where it left off because, you know, this is really important because right now you look at the 3D world. It's crazy, crazy out there. But if you isolate yourself, you know, everybody, you know, says, well, if you ever go to a martial law, we're going to a reservation with you. And I say, why? He said, because reservation is a foreign nation to the United States, just like Texas. Texas can detach from the United States if it wants to, because it was a country itself at one time. So you uh, now the reservations are a, considered a foreign nation. And like out here on the reservation, the state police, the county sheriff, the Gallup, city, city Gallup, they don't have reservation. I mean, they don't have jurisdiction on our reservation. Even the FBI, the only time the FBI will come in is if he or they are invited to do a major crime act. But if they're not, they can't come in and start investigating. So they don't have jurisdiction, you know, on us. So if a martial law gets in, gets implemented in the United States, you come to a reservation, we don't worry about no martial law. All we got to do is keep all the people out, you know, because I'm sure everybody want to come out here. But that's beside the point. Anyway, I got off track, but back to the, back to the aliens. The, oh, oh, okay. I was going to say we had a question from the audience, but, um, it, you know, we were, when you were talking about energy, um, and, and from the audience, she has said, is like when when like it, the way energy is and the way it affects us, she said, is that why some people's energy makes, makes people feel sick? Like be, if they're so down or like you know if they're at a low vibration, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know, or it, or Kim and I like teach that class. Vampires, you know what I mean? You know, I'm gonna put a little advertisement here. Kim and I teach that class about your vibration, your energy, and everything, which which we call it native alchemy, and chakra. We teach you how to raise your energy to where, you know, we need to teach this because I hear a lot of too many people saying, well, I can meditate and go all the way up to the fifth dimension. Well, when you're up in the fifth dimension, who's watching the body? Who's taking care of the body? Because the dark is always out there. And those, you know, those astral parasites, they're not all positive. They're, they're negative. We do have negative sky people out here, the reptilians, you know, they're they're out here in right now walking around the United States. You know, they just, you know, I think the big, biggest example is you watch that Men in Black, you know how the alien came down and got in got in that man's body and walking around like a human. That's the way they that's the way they are. You know, and but Energy is very important to learn because you can feel people's energy. You know, you ever walk into a place where you just don't feel comfortable? That's your that's your uh, personal space warning you. That's your energy warning you. Get out of here. It's not comfortable. And and if you get out of there, your energy will pick back up. Your your energy is really, you know. When I teach this class, I'm a prove it person. I prove to you how you can feel your energy. I'll prove to you how you can do things. And one of the examples I give a lot is that I tell people, I say, stick your tongue out. And they stick their tongue out. I got a lemon in my hand. I'm fixing to put a drop of lemon in your hand. And while I'm talking, all of a sudden you see them slurping. I said, what's the matter? He said, uh, my mouth is getting watery. Okay. Then I say, why is that happening? I just said I was going to do it. I haven't done it yet but you're already doing it. Are you feeling my energy? And he said, well, uh, yeah, I guess so, because my mouth, my body is reacting. You know? And I, and I say, well, what do you feel? And if they don't can't answer that, we work on that until they can identify what they felt. So, you know, I'm a, uh, you know, give me a chance to prove it. It's like grounding. A lot of people say, ah, oh, grounding. I, I I can't feel ground in Mother Earth. I said, because you're not doing it right. You're not doing it right. You know, I can I can tell you how to ground so much that, you know, I tell people, I said, when you ground this way, you be careful. 
I've seen people literally stand up and try to ground up like they do and literally just fall over like a, a tree. You know, just meow. And I said, I, I warned you. You know, I warned you. You know, but, you know, the sky bees, they did teach us a lot of esoteric stuff. And sometimes at this point, you know, the Hopis, the Zunis, when they do a migration down to Grand Canyon, where we migrated from, they do a lot of esoteric traveling to get into where we were migrating from, as we call it, the fourth underworld. And we do still have that, you know, that prayer, that story ingrained in us, and it never changes. It's always the same story. No matter where you are, what you're doing, every Zuni that really knows that story will tell it step by step. And that's what Nasha Mahir is starting to bring out to the people because, I mean, that's very important in our life because there's a lot of things that happen. And, you know, it's it's crazy. So anyway, I let him have a little more time to talk a little more because I'm just talking but um, how did you ask about uh, if you know we all the one place? You know, let's say it says that there was Pangea. You know, the, all the continents that at one point were put together. Even in our creation myth, you know, we are in our creation stories. I always hate using that word myth. I got, I got bunked with that one time. You know, it's not a myth. You know, it's our story. But you know, when we came out, you know, we came out with everyone. And even before we came out, there was also people living on this earth before we came out. So, and at one point we all spoke one language, but because, you know, of, you know, maybe the powers that be, we got too greater or what overpopulation. That's how we ended up started, you know, becoming a uh, split. I mean, it's even written in sacred texts, you know, like even in the Bible, you know, with um what is it the tower of babylon you know they tried to go up to the sky and try to think that they were better than god you know and maybe that kind of stuff happened because when the world was still new anything was possible my grandpa always said you know it was so new that you could just pick up blade of grass and water would come out and you could you know fill your you know fill your thirst with it you know animals could change we could also change shape but throughout history, we ended up losing a lot of that knowledge. But we still are holding on to a lot of the stuff that was given to us. And to this day, we're still practicing it. And, you know, it's sad to say that even in our own culture, our own people don't want to learn anymore. You know, so a lot of this knowledge that we have is being lost. You know, we try to teach the children and, you know, they would rather... You know, go play their games rather than listen to the stories that, you know, our ancestors said. So, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to record what we still have left. So that way, going forward, you know, we'll still be able to use this, hopefully, you know, 100, 200, 300, 400 years from now. Because, you know, the star being said that one day they're going to come back, you know, and if they do, are we going to be able to do what we were told to do, these instructions? And, you know, many of these instructions and many of these taboos and ceremonies that we were given, you know, they came with these instructions that, that we had to follow. But throughout the years and even now in modern times, people want to change that. And I'm a strong advocate of, no, let's continue to do, you know, how grandma and grandpa told us to do this way, because this is the way the star beings told us. Who gave you the right to change this ceremony? Who gave you the right to do it this way? Maybe that's why our world is screwed up now. You know, look at the way that things are now. You know, a lot of these prophecies, a lot of these things that grandma and grandpa said weren't going to happen in our lifetime are happening now. You know, there, there's famine, there's overpopulation, there's wars, there's diseases. How are we going to control that? How are we going to you know, go on living the next 10, 15 years from now, if we can't, you know, hold on to what we have that's sacred and continue to use that, you know, and Kake here, you know, he's learning, he's teaching about the energies, the alchemy and all that. 
you know, I teach about, you know, our creation stories, a lot of many of the things that we have, the songs, the prayers, you know, if someone wants to learn, we teach them, you know, we don't say no, you can't. But, you know, there's also, you know, the person that you're teaching them when we talk, when you're talking about energies, you know, how is that person? Is this person going to use this for good or is this person going to use this for bad? You know, and so you also have to look at that. You have to raise your vibration in order to, you know, be centered in order to take these, you know, ceremonies and perform them the, the way that they're supposed to be done. Well, yeah, in that in that note, you know, um, as far as some of the things that what well, we are taught, esoteric stuff, you know, is still being practiced out here. We got a lot of shapeshifters out here, you know, and it's got so normal to the people that they, they, they just ignore them at nighttime. You know, a lot of people have um, pets out here, dogs especially. They keep them outside. Because they can sense the spirit of a shapeshifter and they'll warn you. And, you know, when they warn you, you know, you say, okay, don't, you know, we're told, don't look outside. Don't go outside at nighttime. I mean, used to be when I was growing up, come nine o'clock, sun's really set, this whole village would die out. You know, everything would shut down and nothing was going on. But nowadays, you know, they don't shut down. They, you know, they live 24-7. Some of these people do. You know, enjoy in the night and sleep during the day, and which is totally reverse. And what he was talking about, some people, some of these younger generation don't want to learn because technology. About maybe about five years ago, we started getting internet out here. Now we have high-speed internet, which a lot of people refuse to bring it in their house, but some of them do. And these kids nowadays, they sit on their iPad, their phones, and they're constantly on the internet. They don't want to learn the traditional ways because to them it's rough. And if you listen to most of the original true prophecies, it doesn't say anything about the end of the world. Why? Because we believe that the sky beams are going to come and, you know, there's not going to be a no nuclear war outbreak because the sky beams are going to take care of that because they want to save Earth because Earth has a big function. Even though it's a little bitty planet in the galaxy system, not the universe, but the galaxy system, it still serves a purpose with the other planets around the galaxy. I mean, if Earth got moved up or blown up or whatever, it's going to mess all the other planets in the solar system. This is why the star beams are starting to come around more. And I believe that the star beams shut down CERN. And they started getting too aggressive with it. They shut it down. And if you think about it, CERN was going real good, real good. They had a celebration, opening celebration for it and everything. And then... When they start to kick it off full force, it got shut down. They don't know what shut it down. And that sky beams are really knowledgeable in technology and everything. They're so far in advance that, you know, we don't still don't understand it. And when you start raising your vibration to the fourth, fifth dimension, that's when you start seeing what they are meant to do. Because another example, you know, Kim and I were going back home to Arkansas and we decided to stop at VLA, very large array in New Mexico, where they filmed contact. Uh, Kim says, I need to do light language. They're telling me to do light language. And all, all those huge satellites, they're so big that it takes a locomotive to move them. They were all pointing it towards us. But when she got out to do light language, all 28, 28 of those satellites did a 180 and pointed away from us. And, and then we looked at it and we said, wow. And when she got done with her light language, and I said, come on, we got to get out of here. And when, we, when she got done, 
got in the car, we drove off. All those satellites came back to the original position they were at. And when it was remote view, those two guys in that building were going crazy, wondering who pushed the button, because before they could move a satellite like that, there's a protocol they have to follow before they push that final button. But two guys said, none of us pushed the button. We don't know what happened. We don't know how it happened. But that's when the, I believe the sky bees want to connect to where they got it, got their energy away from it to where there was a clear connection with the sky bees and Kim. And then as we're departing, you know, like I said, I slept during the training of the star bees. So, you know, I believed in them, but not 100%. And as we were leaving, I looked up to my right side and I said, wow, what is that? That's not a jet because, you know, it's an oblong, like a, like a cigar shaped, you know, thing. So I thought it was a jet, but then there's no chemtrail or there's no exhaust coming out of it. And I kept looking at it, looking at it. Finally, I said, Kim, what is that? She looked at it and says, oh, that's a spaceship. And so I got excited. I'll go take a picture of it. And I got my camera, looked up in, and I quickly pulled my camera up. It was gone. It took off. And I wow. said, wow. And I said, you don't see the ones in the clouds? When I looked up there, I, clear as daylight, I saw spaceships in the clouds as we were leaving. He said, they're just protecting us. That one just wanted you to know that they are for real. And I said, well, I'm a believer now. Normally, I'd be a hard head. He said, show me again. But this time, no. I was 100%. And as I was watching in the clouds, you could actually see them in the clouds. And I started taking pictures of them. And my pictures, you could really see them in there. And I said, wow, these are magnificent. So, you know, these sky beings on the reservation, our, star, our stargazer uses the stars to really determine what time of the year our time because they would say, there's no time. So they would use the stars, the positions of the stars to say, like, he'll say, okay, we've already had our frost, last frost, go ahead and start planting. People will start, go out to their fields and start planting. And then come fall, they'll say, okay, you got two weeks till we have our first frost. All the people, back when I was growing up, the whole tribe would go out there to the fields and help each other harvest the, the crops out there. Watermelon, corn, uh, chili, squash, apples, you remember, whatever they have out in the you know, fields, they would harvest. And Zuni was self-sufficient back when I was growing up. We had one little store that might carry sugar, uh, flour, or bread, or something like that, but that was it. You know, we didn't have a full-blown grocery store because people were self-sufficient where they didn't have to have a grocery store. And now we got a grocery store, brand new one, but it costs an arm and a leg just to go shopping. You know, it never started out like Walmart where we got discount. You know, it's always been high. Everything high and and we just, you know, bear and grin it and go for it. You know, Reservation life is different. And when the star bees are coming out, even to this day, we've seen a lot of younger people that will come out either what we call Pai Mesa, coming up from the south side, going into Zuni Village, they will see lights, you know, spacecrafts flying in with, with them. A, a young lady coming in from Albuquerque from the east side, you know, she, she videotaped a spacecraft following her all the way to Zuni, you know, and she said, I wasn't scared. For some reason, I wasn't scared. I said, well, you shouldn't be. They're there to protect you. You know, that you have a purpose to where they're protecting you. Find out why, you know, and these things that we, you know, I talk about energy and all that. Again, you know, I, um, I always say that we 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 have been taught, we have been shown, and when I, the, and so when I teach the class, that's what I talk about. I talk about, you know, 
what I what I was taught, what I shared information. You know, there's no secret behind what anybody can do. There's no secret. The only secret is your connection between you, the mother, your mother earth, and the creator above. You know, creator above. When you make that connection, things happen. Things to do that, it, as they say in the Emerald Tablets, that words cannot explain. And that's what Julius was saying. Some of our, you know, traditional medicine people, you know, they can do things that words cannot explain. When they shape shift, you know, those things. And when you actually look at it in front of you, you know, and, you know, all these things that, that we have been taught, really, is to us, is the truth and what we try to carry. But like Julia said, he's a strong advocate of keeping it that way. But younger generation are trying to change things to accommodate themselves. It's like going to a church. The preacher will only tell you what you want to hear so he can keep you in the church, you know, but that's what they want to do, but we don't want to do that. You know, if you have to bite your tongue or step on toes, do it in a way to where you don't hurt people's heart. You don't bring their vibration down. You know, things we do is very, very, you know, in a respectable manner. Yeah. So that's all. So a lot of this stuff, you know, it has been taught from day one when we were initiated into our societies. And it's always ingrained in that, that you have to respect that energy. And, you know, like we were talking about now, you know, we got shapeshifters, you know, and with the Internet, you know, kids are learning a lot of the bad stuff online. You know, voodoos, the Mexican witch doctor stuff, even Navajos, you know, they're teaching kids how to do skinwalking. And it's all for bad stuff, you know, and these kids are learning a lot of this stuff and bringing it here. And like Kekia was saying, you know, when we were growing up, we didn't see that stuff. You know, the village shut down at a certain time unless you had to go to ceremony. If you went to ceremony, someone from the Kiva would come pick you up and they would take you straight over there. You know, there was no, you know, OK, well, I got to go to the store. I got to do this. I got to No, you had to go from point A to point B. You know, you covered yourself up, you went there, did your thing. Next morning, you went back home. You know, now, you know, you have people out and about two, three, four o'clock in the morning, you know, doing God knows what. And, you know, it comes down to that, you know, do you really want to learn all this? Stuff? And then you know, what are you going to use it for? Is it going to be for the positivity or is it going to be to hurt someone else? And that's one thing that we're always told not to do. You know, with your hands, with your thoughts, with your mind, even with your words, you can't hurt somebody physically, emotionally, mentally. You can't hurt their heart. And those are the things that we're always told. You know, humble yourself, you know, make sure that you have that reverence for, you know, the creator or, you know, the powers that be. And now, you know, it's like, oh. Well, that was how it was a long time ago. We don't do that now. It's like, well, you know, who gave you that authority? And, you know, now you see people that, you know, learn all some of this. They learn this stuff. And maybe there's that evil entity or parasite that's got onto them to where they don't know what to do. So that's when, you know, you have to really ground yourself in order to do what you have to do. And if you're not grounded, you know, they can snatch you. There's those soul snatchers out there that will take what you have and your essence. You yeah, your essence. Still your essence. You know, and, you know, we can talk about all kinds of things that goes on out here. But uh, the main thing that, you know, Julius and I really want to have people experience is, you know, try to, you know, see what we see out here which is the sky people. You know, I mean, like I said, and if you look at Zuni, we are in direct line from Roswell, New Mexico, all the way to Area 51. We are in direct line. And maybe that's why there's a lot of, you know, 
as they say, unidentified aerial phenomenon going on. But a lot of people are witnessing it. Yeah. Even even uh, what happened? What happened? I'm sure. Oh, yeah, we had uh, one of our night dances uh, about three weeks ago. And uh, right after everything was done, you know, everybody was going home. People saw UFOs on the south side of the village. And, you know, lately, a lot of that activity has picked up around here. And, you know, a lot of our Zuni friends here in, um, you know, around Zuni and, you know, the surrounding areas have been seen a lot of these unidentified flying objects and they've been posting it on facebook so there is you know a following of that you know just like last night too there was a powwow i can't remember where it was and someone posted that there was a ufo there was ufos that came down it looked like a meteor was coming down and then what happened was it came down and then in the middle of the sky it just stopped and i think there was like four or five things that just went off and there were these orbs that were just sitting there and people are wondering what it was you know and they're making their presence known and you know even people that don't believe here you know they're posting it on facebook they're posting it on instagram they're like what's happening why are they coming out now and you know they've always been there but now they're actually showing themselves or maybe you know, we just have, you know maybe we're blinded now we're actually seeing these things you know come to par so, but what do we do? What's their message? You know, we and we don't know that. Yeah, that's why we kind of depend on these light language people, you know, to connect with them. That's it. Like I said, we don't have our stargazer anymore. And the galaxy of eternity is not like they used to be. You know, I don't I don't see a lot of well, there's no reason to go astral traveling because when you raise your vibration up, they'll come to you. These sky beings will come to you. And <clears throat> that's why when we come to do our tour, we want people to try to experience what we're seeing. And if things go well, they will see it. They will see what we're seeing. And now if they try to try to get some kind of explanation, we'll just say, well, what did you see? That's your explanation. That's your proof. You know, and they're going to say, well, uh, how are people gonna believe me? Well, that's you. That's up to you to decide how you're gonna convince the people. You know, and sometimes it's that gift that's given to you. Maybe you're the one that told. You know, that's you know their way of showing that to you to make you believe. But we don't know. Yeah. So, you know, this tour that we're gonna do again, we're gonna go to VLA. We're gonna go sky uh, sky watching. If we spend the night in Akama. Gonna go sky watching there. Then we're gonna come to Zuni, go to El Moro, gonna go to Great Kiva Ruins, where they have those pictographs and everything. Let them see it firsthand. Let them see it firsthand to say, wow, you know, because us talking about it and everything, you know, doesn't, people, do, it. That's... doesn't do it. But when, right. you know, I got, a, I got a question. Um, but, but before we get more, I, 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 someone from the audience wanted to know what's the, uh, the native uh, tradition on little people and the fae or the fairies, like, and, and not just the fairies, but like, do you guys have like stories of little people too? For example, like there's this lady that comes on my show. Her name is Mary Joyce. She found a whole thing in North Carolina about these Cherokee little people that possibly exist there. And they call them Cherokee little people because they, they look, they, they, they resemble supposedly Cherokee. And, and then, well, and then, and then over in Ireland, you have like, Stories of like the fae or the fairies and you the know, little people and stuff like that, and it is St. Patrick's Day, so I figured I would bring that up. So okay, <laughs> well, Robert, you know we we call them Inodek. They're ancient. You know they've been here longer than we have. You know, and um, you know even at El Moro, when you go up to the top of the ruins, the doors are only about two feet tall. You know, and our ancestors said that's how tall our ancients were. You know, and they're still here. You know, whenever we have uh, a lot of seismic activity that go on, you know, and sometimes we get you know, those um, tremors here. And if anything happens here, there's little people that come out in the village. You know, they're finding tunnels underneath the village and little homes that are there for the little people. But, you know, out of respect, because they're, you know, they're, 
you know, we, you know, some people, you know, leave them offerings, you know, like when we do our food offerings, cornmeal and stuff like that, you know, we leave offerings or even they'll even talk to them. You know, if you lost something, you know, you know, help me find it or, you know, little people, please help me find it or little people, please help me to, you know, cure whatever ails me because they have that knowledge as well. And, you know, they, they, there are prayers and stuff that talk about, oh, little mummies we couldn't hear you there your mic cut out for the last couple of things you said all right yeah in oh. that i believe it was in the 1970s or 1980s there was archaeologists that actually found little mummies of little people but the tribe where the governors the religious people saw them and then when it went into the white, the hands of the white people or the scientists that came in, they disappeared. So we, we never got to get them back and we don't know whatever happened to them. And there's uh, ruins out here that have these little small houses, little kivas and all, you know, but, you know, they can't date them back, you know, because those are restricted areas because they're ceremonial. Wow. Okay, uh, I guess the easiest way to explain the difference is that we have our Chaco era. We have our Pueblo Bonita era. We have all these kind of, you know, different uh, eras that, you know, during the Pueblo time. But before the Pueblo time, what he's talking about, Inotequet is what they call Anasazis. They're the little people. And those, when you see a ruins and the door is only like two feet high and maybe maybe uh, 12 inches wide, those are the little people, you know. And what he's talking about, the villages underneath our village, our village is like, uh, kind of like uh, Taos, Taos, New Mexico. Your neighbors are not across the street. They're on top of your house. You know, we stack our adobe houses, our rock houses. They're stacked to where, like I said, you can go up to fourth high to get up there. And that they built that was, because of protection, you don't have a front door on your walls. When 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 they they have ladders, so when the other tribes or Spanish invasion happen, every night before they go to bed, they pull up that ladder. After everybody gets in gets home, they pull up the ladder, and they can't burn the rock down. So you know, and if they try to shoot it, you know, rock's gonna rock is gonna keep that bullet away. So. You know, that was there for protection. In Zuni here, we have that middle village. And in that middle village, right underneath is what he's talking about. There's another village right underneath the current village. And those are the little people village down below us. And when something happens, they come out. You know, they come out. And 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 the sad part about the whole thing is that... Um, I got a little video shot of it yesterday is we have our kivas all around the, in that middle village area. Right smack in the middle is a dead gum Catholic church. No. That's, yeah. that's covering the vortex of the energy of the village. All our kivas are around that Catholic church. and They're blocking it because we're probably one of the only tribes that do not go to mass before we have our dances. You go to other tribal places, Pueblos, down the Rio Grande Corridor, they go to church before they go out and do their traditional dancing. Why? Because of the Catholic influence. That's one thing that really, you know, I'm glad we're not like that because us being so isolated from the real grand order and everything with along with the Hopis, we kept our tradition. And we us and the Hopis have our own strong native tongue where nobody, no other tribe can speak our tongue. If you're not a Zuni, you can't speak Zuni. If you're not Hopi, you can't speak Hopi. But there's been intermarriages between Zuni and Hopi to where, you know, people learn. You know, people taught each other, 
how to how to communicate. So some Zunis can speak Hopi, some Hopis can speak Zuni. But if a like a Taos or Santa Clara person comes to Zuni, they can't understand it. It's a foreign language, you know. And so, you know, that's that's what he meant about things that are the little people homes are underneath, and our ruins. That's in fact. On our tour, we're going to stop at El Moro and we're going to give people you know, time to hike that mountain. And that that's what El Moro is an inscription rock, what they call it, Atsina. From the very first contact with the Spaniards, they came to El Moro because El Moro has a fresh aquifer. And they will water their horses over there, you know, get their water over there. And while they're there, they would actually put their name on it. Ornado's name, Pizarro, Juan de Onato names on there. There's over 2,000 pictographs on that rock. And we're going to, and it's got a ruins up there on top where the Zuni people live. And that's where the little people live, the Anasazis, meaning that they were only, they were probably less than two feet tall. You know, and, and that's why, you know, that's one of the places we're gonna stop and tour it, you know. So we got we got a lot of good things coming up. I got another one more question, Greg, before we go. This is an interesting one too. I, I remember hearing an interview before where they said that there was uh cataclysms and um the ant people came out and like took the people into caves for shelter. Do you know that story and do you do you follow that? Do you do you agree with that? Like oh, that, that happened in the past? Yeah. Well, you show you uh good dog. Uh, okay. Well, there is a story in Zuni, but it's really hard to translate it. You know, he's telling me, he says, I, I remember that story, but it's really hard to interpret it in the Zuni, I mean, into English way, because, you know, what happened then, you know, and all that. And and uh, what what's sad about it is is that a lot of the, when the Catholics came, they took a lot of, of course, the younger people, and put them in boarding schools. Like our grandpa, my grandpa, my mama's dad, his name was Naslil. He went to Santa Fe. When he came home, he said, oh, they gave me a new name. My name is now Matthew Solomon. I said, Matthew Solomon? He said, yeah, they picked the names out of the Bible and gave me a name. So his name was Nath Matthew Solomon. Now, my other grandpa, Natachu, Never went to a boarding school. So he kept his name Natachu. My my grandpa on my daddy's side, his name was Yawa Kawaeko. But when he passed on, he had, he had three sons. The boys decided to keep Yawa Kia. And the, the girls decided to keep Waeko. Well, when my dad and his brother decided to say, I'm going to take Yawa Kia. Well, my brother said, I'm going to be different. I want to be Yawaki. So we are the first generation of Yawaki, which is Y-A-W-A-K-I-A. -A -A. And my, my uncle George's family is the first generation of Yawaki, which is Y-A-W-A-K-I-E. So, you know, some of these people that did not go to boarding school kept their uh you know, their Zuni names. And it's really hard to say, like one of my elder teachers, his name was Talabdinaho Hai. You know, but I knew him by the Kiva name of Shuhonakti. You know, we got all kinds of names for our way, you know, and what Kiva, you have your Kiva name in the Kachina name. My name in the Kachina name is Iwani. My medicine name is Otisiwa, you know, and my father's name is Yawaka. And where I got Imsa, I don't know. But my actual name was Imsa Yawaka until, you know, nobody could say that. So it, Greg got added on, you know, later on. But but that's okay. I'm, I'm okay with that, you know, because now, like her daughter, when she was born, you know, I gave my grandma's name to her because I told her to change it. 
That's only one of the names. Her name was Kalastiwa. Alta Kalastiwa. That was her real name. Her name or whatever. But now her traditional name is Kalastiwa. You know, so I know names get confused and everything. It's part of our life. You introduce yeah. yourself. You depending on what you have. You introduce yourself. You know. And uh, Greg, your mic was cutting out there. We couldn't hear you. Okay, they they give us names to to carry on. You know, for our family, which is good. Because we are a close knit family, we you go through our patrilineal and matrilineal family. Depending on what's going on, you can support your patrilineal or your matrilineal clan, depending on who's doing what. So, it's all about structuralism and functionalism in Zuni. But that'd be another podcast, you know, if you want to talk about it. But, yeah, well, yeah, we can. We can do another one, maybe in a week or so, and you can. We can have your nephew back if he'd like to join us too. This was amazing, but I wanted to take the last couple of minutes so you could tell us all about the uh, the, the the excursion that you're going to do, the trip, and like how when it's going to be, like um, and all the details, and have people want to sign up, how they can do that. Okay, well, our first tour is going to be May 15. Is when we're going to start it. Tour dates are 16, 17, and 18. It's going to be three days. It's going to, uh, we're coming up with a price because uh, where we're going to go is going to be really like in the reservations. We're not going to go like, we're going to go to New York City and see the museum, and we're not going to do that. We're going to take the back roads. Like I said, we're going to go to VLA where they can, where they can see where, I mean, we're going to actually go into the building of the VLA and listen to the sky that they're listening to 24-7. That they, um, I think it's run by a private company now. We can listen to the sky. Then after that, we're going to take off, go go to Akama Indian Reservation and get a room, spend the night there first night, and we're going to go stargazing that night. You know, depending on the weather, we can go stargazing for a couple hours and then Rest up, and then the following morning we're gonna to go to uh, El Moro National Park, which they have the like I said the Anasazi people there. The inscription rock. It's it's a good two mile hike that everybody can go on. And other than me, I get, I get lazy, but it's a good mountainous hike. And Julius will probably go with y'all and just to kind of tell you a little bit about everything. And uh, then we come back. Then we go to the Great Kiva ruins, where where the pictographs of the aliens and the supernova is. Then after that, we're gonna spend the night at a bed and breakfast place in Zuni Reservation, which is gonna be Friday night. And then we're gonna get up Friday Saturday morning. We're gonna to go to a place called Hanta Pintia, which is a more prescription uh, inscription rocks. Then after that, you know, we'll probably come go to Hawiku, which is the first contact that was made by the Spaniards. That's where the first Catholic church was built in 1629. And, you know, and we're going to take a look at that. I mean, tour the area and then come back to Zuni. Let you all shop around the local villages with the local vendors. And, and the museum they got out here, go check it out. It's got a lot of good history on it. Then we'll probably start heading back towards Albuquerque. And depending on how much time we have, Saturday, I might stop at some more photographs right west side of Albuquerque. And then spend the night in Albuquerque. And Sunday is a time of day for people to get back home. So the trip is going to start at May 15th. And Get a hold of me at one week Wait, Greg, your your mic cut out again. Sorry. You said how can people get a hold of you? One Nation Tribal Alliance. Yeah. And, and do you want to give your e email too? Or no? My email is my last name, Yawakia Y A W A K I A 
at yahoo.com. Okay, that's great. I mean, this sounds fun. I think I'm gonna have to try to come. It sounds amazing. I can't wait to. I can't wait to uh, hear more about it. And and if you want to do a show next week, we can do that too. You know, and and we can help you promote it more. You know. Okay. Also, also our classes. A lot of people got interested in energy classes. We do. Kim and I teach about native alchemy and chakra, along with our seven. Um, energy points you know and we teach about that because and now as my part on a native alchemy i teach about the symbology the strength of the symbology of alchemy in a medicine well and i only go up to four chakra because the first four chakras or the first four energy points is about you getting yourself straightened out first before you go into the esoteric because once you get into the esoteric, that's where that's where remote viewing starts in, you know, shape shifting starts happening. That's where astral travel starts happening. And you, and that takes a lot of time. And I am gonna start uh, the mentorship program probably in May. May. It's gonna be a six month one on one mentorship. One on one, and as soon as I get it all worked out, I'm gonna post it, and it's gonna cost now because this is one on one mentorship, and the only way I want people to take it, I'm not gonna take a lot of people, but the people that I take, I want them to make sure they wanna take the class because it's gonna take a lot of their commitment, not mine but theirs, and I will commit to them to teach them. What I share the knowledge, and also April the seventh, I will be at Serpent Mounds doing a lecture. At Sunday at five thirty, I will be doing a lecture at Serpent Mound. Serpent Mound has a lot of activity, and I've been invited to come speak at that place. So I'll be out there. Anybody close by? Serpent Mound is in Peebles, Ohio. Yeah, and I then, live like four hours away from there. Yeah, I might come to that. That's amazing. I didn't know okay. you were yeah, I'm real close yeah. to it. Come on. Come on. You know, as I say, come on. And okay. um, I'll send you the link about it. Yeah, send okay. me all the links. Yeah, we'll post it in the description, you know. Okay. Also, you know, what I'm going to do is after the equinox, I'm going to do a lot of cleansing and protection ceremony. And I know people are worried about how much it costs. I don't charge other than donation. You know, so I'll be doing a lot of cleansing and protection ceremony after the eclipse. After the eclipse on Monday. So. Okay. Well, that's thank all you so much. Yeah. That, thank you so much, guys, for coming on today. This was amazing. And uh, yeah, thank you. It was really nice meeting your nephew. And, and, uh, yeah, and, and we'll do it again soon, Greg. And, and yeah. thank you guys, and have a good day. And if you ever watch up there, your mic cut out. Sorry. That's it. If you ever want to do a podcast with him, he's very knowledgeable. You, okay. I, I'll give you his information. You can get a hold of him. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, for sure. All right. All right, Bob. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. And I have another show at 7 p.m. Eastern. So.